month of October, I thought on this Reformation Sunday that it would be good this Sunday morning to look at a gospel passage and to hear the words of the Lord Jesus himself and a gospel passage that helps us to be clear about what the gospel is, to understand what the good news is, the good news of being right with God. That really was at the heart of the struggle of the Reformation 500 years ago, to understand what has God said about the way to be in friendship and fellowship with God. How can a man or a woman who has sinned against God be right with God? That is at the heart of the Reformation that we remember today, and it is at the heart of the Bible's presentation and Mark's presentation of Jesus, who he is and why he came. I would imagine that most of people who've gathered here this morning are Christian believers or uh, belong to the Protestant tradition. We may have Baptist folk, we may have Pentecostal folk, we may have Presbyterians, all kinds of backgrounds, but I'm sure that almost everyone here today would want to celebrate the Protestant Reformation and see that there was a great rediscovery, recovery of something valuable 500 years ago. But it's possible to be a Protestant or to have our name on the roll of members of a local church and still be a bit unclear, a bit fuzzy about how to be right with God. And it would be a tragedy to mark Reformation Sunday and the achievements of Luther and Calvin and Knox and so many others without being clear on what the gospel is for ourselves. So that's what I want us to do with our time today, to celebrate the gospel by knowing what the good news, what the gospel is all about. Gospel is a biblical word. You find it in the New Testament something like 76 times. It's a noun to describe something called the good news. The Greek word euangelion just means good news. The gospel is our English word for that concept in Greek of good news. Maybe we should talk about the good news instead of talking about the gospel, but there is something attractive about that old English word gospel as well. Uh, God spiel, a, a story that is good a story that is the good news. It's just an old English word for good news, the gospel. Think about Luther, that Augustinian monk who nailed his 95 Theses to the castle church in Wittenberg on the 31st of October, 1517. All about repentance, all about the gospel, all about what the heart of turning back to God involved. Before his conversion, before he became a new person in Jesus, Luther was confused. Luther was torn by guilt and shame and fear. He was a Bible teacher and a preacher and a theologian and a priest, but he was carrying a heavy, heavy burden of guilt, of shame, and of fear. What changed Luther was the gospel which he discovered as he read through the Bible, especially the letters of Paul. It was the good news that was explained and explained and explained again and again by Jesus and the apostles that finally got inside Luther's mind and heart and changed him and released him to be a man at peace with God by grace and through faith. On the Reformed side of the Reformation movement, if you think of people, figures like John Calvin, they celebrated the gospel with great clarity and precision. One of the things that Calvin taught the church to understand is that there 
uh, really are two aspects to the gospel that uh, lead to you being right with God, and they are repentance and faith. We turn away from a life of sin and guilt and put our trust in the Lord God and in his gospel invitation. Repentance and faith, these two always belong together, and we don't just begin the Christian life at that point, but that we carry on the Christian life with turning from sin to God and turning to God in faith and trust. The gospel calls us to be believing penitents always, penitent believers always, not just at the beginning, but for the whole of Christian life. But is it biblical? Is it the teaching of the Word of God? I want to suggest to you this morning, as we have Mark's gospel open before us, as we've had a reading from Mark 7, that we could just take Mark and think about how he presents Jesus to us. You go to Mark chapter 1 and to the very first verse in this gospel, and Mark records the beginning of the gospel, the beginning of the good news about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And the first words of the Lord Jesus that Mark records in this gospel are found in Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. And again, it's about the gospel. We read there, after John, John the Baptist, was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the gospel, the good news of God. And what did Jesus say? The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the gospel, the good news. So what Calvin was teaching 500 years ago, 1,500 years after the time of Jesus, was exactly what Jesus was teaching according to the gospel of Mark. What the gospel writers wrote down, what Paul the apostle and the other apostles wrote down in their letters was not uh, being faithfully taught all through the centuries. It was recovered, it was rediscovered by the Reformers 500 years ago. The gospel movement of 500 years ago was a back to the gospel movement, back to the Bible movement, back to ask basic questions. What is humanity? What's wrong with humanity? And what is God's answer? What is God's solution to the problem of what is wrong with us? So we celebrate the gospel today that gospel recovered these hundreds of years ago. And we do it because nothing else will meet the needs of your heart and your life. What is the gospel? Can you define what the gospel good news is all about? If I asked you, could you express to me in a few words what the gospel is, could you do that clearly? If somebody came to your door and rang the doorbell, I had this yesterday with a Jehovah's Witness coming with a leaflet. Could we, in a few words, explain what the good news is to us, to someone, maybe who just comes across our path, someone in a family, a friend, someone we're studying with, working with, and they ask us, what do you believe? Well, I believe good news. Could you explain the good news? in a few words. If we want to be Protestants in the tradition of Martin Luther, we should be able to give an answer. What is the gospel? What is the good news? But I want to suggest to you this morning that there are two things that we could remember and learn from Mark 7 that would be helpful in celebrating the gospel. And they're simple to think about and simple to remember. The first is this, the gospel is bad news about your heart. The good news of the gospel begins with bad news. We don't really get to explain the good news about Jesus until we have faced up to the bad news about ourselves. So the gospel, good news, is bad news about us and how we are on the inside 
before it becomes good news about what God has done in Jesus. That's the first thing. The gospel is bad news about your heart. Do you want to hear again one of the shortest little parables, teaching stories that Jesus ever told? Mark has it in Mark 7, verse 14 and 15. Hear the word of God. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. And then the parable asks just one little sentence, one little verse. Nothing outside a man can make him unclean by going into him. Rather, it is what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. So there you have it. There's the bad news of the human condition. There's the bad news of the gospel of Jesus Christ in one little verse in Mark chapter 7. I want to suggest to you that this is one of the shortest explanations of the gospel bad news that you could read anywhere. And what Jesus is saying, in effect, in these verses is that there is something wrong with humanity. There's something wrong with the whole of humanity. There's something wrong with children growing up maybe in lovely homes with every advantage. There's something wrong with your parents who may be elderly parents and they may have been good to you, but there's something wrong with them. There's something wrong with that special person. We've got folk in church who've maybe just been married for a few months or in the first year or two of marriage, and maybe we think that the one that we love is almost without fault. And yet Jesus says in this verse, listen to me, everyone, understand this. Nothing outside a man can make him unclean by going into him. Rather, it's what comes out of a man or out of a woman that makes him unclean. This was at the heart of Jesus' argument, his dispute with the Pharisees, in Mark chapter 7. And it was part of the heart of the dispute between the reformers of 500 years ago and the universal church of their day. The Roman Catholic Church was not teaching the gospel 500 years ago by and large because the church had become complacent about human beings and their abilities. The church had become convinced that human beings weren't that bad, really. And that with a bit of spit and polish and a bit more effort and a bit more help through sacraments and penance and reconciliation and just trying a bit harder, we could make ourselves good enough for God. And Jesus says to religious Jewish people of his own day, you're very concerned about outward cleanliness or things that make somebody unclean. So the opening part of Mark 7 is all about a dispute. Your disciples, Jesus, they're not washing their hands according to the tradition of our elders, our fathers. There isn't actually very much in the Old Testament about this. You'll see the priests when they take their turn in the tabernacle or in the temple as they go in being washed and anointed. But there doesn't seem to me to be any clear teaching in the Word of God that talks about any kind of ritualized washing for ordinary men and women of God in Israel in the Old Testament and in the Old Covenant. But people have added on their layer after layer of teaching and tradition that is in, of human origin, and they've said, well, the world is what contaminates you. And you need to wash your hands from all that contamination so that you've got to be constantly trying to make yourself in a state where you are clean enough to approach God, clean enough even, even to eat or to drink or whatever. Now, from a hygiene point of view, it may make perfectly good sense to wash your hands. If, I, if I'm uh, making 
um, I don't know, cheese on toast, I probably wash my hands three times, you know, wandering around the kitchen. Uh, I'm forever uh, washing my hands, and that probably tell, tells you quite a bit about the way I was brought up and the, the concerns of uh, my parents or whatever, uh, to have no bugs and no germs. I prefer that way to the other way, you know, where it's on the flow, I'd be fine. Five-second rule, it's all right. Nobody will notice, just give it to the guests and nobody will mind. You know what I'm saying? But if you think that washing your hands gets you closer to God, you've gone beyond hygiene. If you think that not washing your hands in a particular way excludes you from God, you are a legalist like modern followers of Islam. You are a legalist, a ritualist. You haven't understood that the bad news is it's not washing your hands that is required. It's washing your thoughts. It's washing your desires. It's washing your will. It's washing your heart. And the gospel starts by saying, Merely human attempts to tidy yourself up, merely human attempts to reform, merely human rule-keeping can never change your heart. We could give you a long list of commandments, a long list of rules about diet or about the home or about this, that, or the other. I've got um, two daughters who are young, so I suppose I could, I could write a whole chapter, a whole book about who you shouldn't date. You know, that would be a good book, wouldn't it? Rules for dating. I wonder if I could get a publisher for that book. I've got a son as well. Maybe somebody else is writing a book about him, <laughs> even as we speak. But you know what I'm saying this morning? Telling someone that, don't touch that, don't go there, don't watch that, don't read that, doesn't actually change the heart. The bad news of the gospel is that our problem does not really rest in what comes into us from outside. If I got in trouble when I was small, the get-out-of-jail-for-free card would be to blame another boy. A bad influence. So it might be the boy next door. He's a bit older. He should know better. He's led you astray because you, little darling, would never, ever, ever think of breaking windows or stealing turnips or whatever the crime was. But sometimes it's our little darlings who are the ones who are leading others astray, and they don't need much help because the gospel is realistic about our heart. And Jesus is realistic about our heart. And Jesus says the Corban rule that he discusses in verses 9 to 13, where very observant Jewish people were ignoring the fifth commandment to respect and care for and honor their father and mother because they'd made up their own rule about devoting or dedicating their wealth and their property to some imaginary project. Oh, I can't spend money on my parents because I've promised that to God when I'm finished with it myself. So I'll ignore the clear commandment of God in his Ten Commandments by observing the fake and phony commandments of human beings and the traditions of the fathers. And Jesus says, no, your problem is with your heart. Your heart doesn't love your father and mother, and your heart doesn't love God as it should. The problem is in your heart. There's already plenty evil inside you to ruin your relationship with God regardless of what may come into you from outside. Now, there may be bad influences and there may be evil things that come into us from outside. But our heart is already an idol factory 
and it's already sinful and evil and wicked. The bad news is my heart, your heart, the heart of every human is full of sin and capable of every kind of sin. You might be thinking, well, why did God give any rules for outward conduct to Israel? Why did God mention anything about uh, certain dietary rules to Israel? And I suppose the answer would be that under the old covenant and the rules for being clean and unclean, that God wished to set apart very clearly his Old Testament people as a separate and distinctive people who were not part of the rest of humanity, and they were marked out by certain things that God gave to them and certain commands that God gave to them. But the purpose of those commands was not to change the heart. It couldn't. A kosher kitchen doesn't change your heart. It may mark you out as being Jewish in a world that's on the run from God. It may mark you out as being part of the covenant people of God. But it cannot deal with the need to be circumcised in the heart. To be changed inside. So what things does Jesus say come from inside and make us unclean? It's a pretty awful list, isn't it? The disciples, who were rather dull of hearing and understanding, ask Jesus to explain, and he does this in verse 20, having declared all the dietary laws to be um, expired, having declared all foods to be clean. In verse 19, he says, what comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. What's inside you is your sin. It's your evil. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, folly, and that awful list. You could maybe add to it the evils that you know and that you discover within yourself. Sometimes our problem is not lust. Our problem is not anger. Our problem is not greed, but it might be jealousy. It might be pride. It might be wanting to be first. It might be wanting our children or grandchildren to be at the head of the queue of success and not really rejoicing when other people know blessing or encouragement. I don't know how God might be touching you today or what sin God might be reminding you of or telling you that you need to deal with, but you cannot fix your heart. And the gospel recovered 500 years ago says, start with the bad news. Your inside is the problem. Your heart is the problem. Be a biblical realist. We're living in an era where people think if we ban things, they will go away. If we ban smacking, then all violence in households and all cruelty to children will go away. If we ban fracking, then there'll be no mess, no litter, no pollution. If we ban burqas, then all Islamic terrorism will end. If we ban diesel cars, then we'll all be young and fit and live to 104. Let's ban something, eh? Let's get a petition to fix children, fix society, fix the city, fix the slums, fix the brokenness of our world. But you know, all the parliaments in all the world cannot pass a law to change your heart. The gospel is realistic and revolutionary because it says the problem is inside and God alone can change your inside. The gospel is bad news about your heart. J.C. Ryle back in the 1880s said, we ought to remember this in training and education of our children. Never forget that the seeds of all mischief and wickedness are in their hearts. It's not enough to keep boys and girls at home and shut out every outward temptation. They carry within them a heart ready for any sin. When children go wrong, it is a common practice to lay all the blame on bad companions. 
Then Ryle says, Bad companions are an evil, no doubt, and an evil to be avoided as much as possible. But no bad companion teaches a boy or girl half as much as sin in their own hearts will suggest to them, unless they are renewed by the Spirit. So, mums, dads, grandparents, your boys and your girls need your prayers and they need the gospel, and they need to hear about Jesus Christ. Having good friends is great. Having good interests and hobbies is great. But having the Holy Spirit and the love of the Lord and the grace of God is essential. The gospel is bad news about your heart. The second thing, the gospel is good news for your heart. And it is the good news of a person. It is the good news of a Savior. It is the good news of Jesus. The way to be new is through knowing Jesus. Knowing Jesus makes of us new people. Not the old people who are ruled by our bad hearts, but new people recreated by the grace of God, being taught and led by the Spirit, being given a new nature, being given a new heart, being transformed and made fit for a future with God in the glory of God. What does Christianity hang on? It'd be tempting, this is Sermon 7, I think, in a series on the Reformation. It would be tempting to think, well, I know all this stuff, justification by faith, the Reformation solus, Scripture alone, faith alone, Christ alone, the glory of God alone, and so on. I just, if I get the right theology, if I sign the right catechism, if I believe the right stuff, I'll be okay. But actually, it is most important that we know the Savior, the Lord Jesus himself. Not just know about him or agree to the right facts about him, but that we know him at the heart of the Word of God, at the heart of the New Testament Scripture, is what Don Carson has called the Christ event. The central moment that changes history and the world is that after the life and the death and the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus, there really is no way to change. There is no way to peace. There is no way to joy. There is no way to be the friend of God without coming to God through that central event, that Christ event, depending on Jesus Christ. The gospel is Jesus. The good news is that God's Son came to be a Savior died for the guilt and shame and sin and wickedness of his people, and he asks you to repent and believe, to turn to him in trust and faith. Sometimes people talk about the simple gospel, the ABCs of the gospel. And there's a sense in which the gospel is that ABC. What, what does it mean to turn in repentance and faith? It can be as simple as A, B, C. A, admit you're a guilty sinner. B, is believe the gospel facts and commit yourself to them. Believe them in the heart in the sense that you lean on them, you rely on them. C, commit. Give yourself to this Christ who died for sinners. A, B, C. It really can be as simple as that. That is the gospel in a nutshell. Turn as a sinner guilty and give yourself sin and all to Jesus Christ. But as Tim Keller and others have pointed out, there's also a sense in which the gospel is bigger than the ABC. That the gospel and having Christ at the center means that the whole of our life becomes about living by faith turning to God every day, relying on God every day, and having Christ as King over us every day. So from beginning to end, from A to Z of our life, becomes about the gospel of knowing Jesus, following Jesus, being united to Jesus. 
A to Z. What grid do you use to look at your life, to look at the choices that are before you, to look at the roads that are before you? For the A to Z of life, Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Does Jesus Christ, who lives in me and for whom I live, does Jesus Christ have something to say to me about this area of my life that is full of sin or full of fear or full of compromise or is not being fruitful? The gospel is our ABC and the gospel is our A to Z. Um, Keller says, the gospel is not the first step in a stairway of truths, rather it's more like the hub of a wheel of truth. The gospel is not just the ABCs, but the A to Z of Christianity. The gospel is not just the minimum required doctrine necessary to enter the kingdom, but the way we make progress in the kingdom. And that gospel addresses us as human beings in all our need in all our humanity. That gospel calls for the whole person to respond, your mind, your intellect, your emotion, your will, to become obedient to the gospel, obedient to Jesus. God gives you his heartfelt gospel call. Are you tired? Are you weary and you burdened? Come to me to receive the gift of peace, the gift of salvation, the gift of my Son, why would you turn anywhere else when God offers you Christ as Savior? And I need to finish. Let's go back to Luther just for a wee moment. Luther was a well-read man. He knew the classics. He knew uh, the culture of the ancients, the philosophers of Greece and the poets of Rome. He knew all that stuff. He was a well-educated man, a lecturer and a thinker, even before his conversion. And in one place, Luther discusses the Roman poet and playwright Horace, and uh, he quotes some guidelines that Horace is supposed to have given to writers who wanted to write for the theater. And you've maybe heard this piece of advice from Horace to playwrights. If you're thinking of writing something for the stage, here's good advice for you. Horace said, do not bring a god onto the stage unless the problem requires a god to solve it. So the theater of the Mediterranean two, two and a half thousand years ago, Zeus would walk onto the stage or Mercury or one of the, the gods of the pantheon of Greece or of Rome, the, uh, the gods and goddesses would interact with humans on the stage. And Horace says, don't bring on a god unless the problem needs a god to fix it. Luther references that and he says, our problem, our heart problem, our problem of salvation and eternal life is such a problem that it requires not a church to fix it. It requires not the Pope to fix it. It requires not a priest to fix it. It requires not a sacrament to fix it. Our problem is a problem, the problem of the heart. It is a problem that requires God to fix it. Our sin offends God. We cannot change ourselves. Our heart is full of poison and selfishness and blackness and darkness. We cannot make it white. But God has come on the stage to fix it. He did that in the Christ event. He did that in the life, the death, the resurrection, the glorious ascension of Jesus Christ. This, says Luther, is such a problem that demands a God to solve it. God has solved through the gospel the bad news problem of your heart. My question for myself and for you is have you believed and responded to the good news that God holds out Jesus Christ to you and he says, come to me through my son.
and rely on him completely for your right standing with God. Have you? Will you? Will you now? Father, we ask that we may celebrate good news, celebrate the good news of your work on behalf of sinners through Christ your Son. He died for sinners. He was raised for our justification. He is at your right hand. He prays, he pleads, he intercedes. May we come to you responding to your good news and saying, yes, the bad news is true and the good news is true. I am a sinner, but Jesus came for sinners. I, sinner that I am, give myself to you. Hear our prayers, Lord, and give us joy in believing. Amen.